Hello, my wonderful people, whoever is watching this presentation. I appreciate it. And my name is Cyril White. I'm a certified financial planner and chartered sustainable, responsible impact investing counselor with four financial managements located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And several of my clients expressed an interest in the topic of sustainable investing. Uh, more specifically, the divestment of companies that invest in fossil fuels in their portfolios and what the pros and cons of such a strategy might be uh, for their wealth and their assets and their portfolios that we manage for them. So I did the research and came up with this presentation, uh, which I thought maybe other people might be interested in. So that's why I made a recording of it. And I hope you find something useful in it. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, please give me comments in the various social media where this will be posted or shoot me an email uh, or a phone call and uh, which my contact information I will supply at the end of the presentation. And I'd be happy to answer any questions for you that you might have at that time. So let's dig in here. My background, who am I? I've been a financial advisor, wealth management, wealth manager, financial planner, uh, consultant, whatever you want to call me. I've helped people for over 25 years manage their assets and work towards achieving their financial goals. I received my undergraduate degree at the Engineering School of the University of Michigan back in 1991, but I was always interested and fascinated with the stock market, business markets, how businesses worked, how markets worked. So the natural progression for me was to get my master's in business and finance degree at the University of Chicago and then go work for a large Wall Street investment bank uh, where I learned the business and then ultimately founded my own firm in 2001 in Chelsea, Michigan called White House Financial became a certified financial planner in 2005 and a chartered sustainable responsible impact investing counselor uh, this past year and I merged my firm White House Financial with for financial management in Ann Arbor in 2014 so I could create more scale and having more well-rounded diversified team to help manage my client relationships and their investments, which has worked out beautifully. And basically that's who I am. So let's delve into the subject of sustainable investing, also known as sustainable responsible investing or SRI, um, which was back when I started in 1997, formerly known as socially responsible investing. Uh, one of my first clients was an order of nuns that owned a bunch of hospitals, and that was my first introduction to SRI, or at the time known as socially responsible investing. And our client wanted to make sure that in their portfolio, their, none of the companies that their money managers owned in their asset portfolios that were managed for the order and their hospitals that we were managing for them owned any firearms, uh, nuclear weapons, defense firms, pornography firms, um, alcohol was okay, uh, but all of these other so-called sin stocks were not okay. They didn't want anything to have to do with warfare or killing um, or anything of that nature or any companies that dealt with those types of things invested in their portfolio. So every quarter we would make sure and do a screen of their entire portfolio and their investment managers and their assets to make sure that they did not own any of these companies. Um, SRI um, more recently has become known as ESG investing which stands for environmental social and governance. It's a very uh, popular area both positive and negative in the media these days and ESG or environmental, social, and governance basically deals with the full integration of environmental, social, and governance 
factors into investment analysis and portfolio management. Uh, but the bottom line, what SRI or ESG um, was initially created to do and hopefully is still created to do is to align an investor's values with their investments. Some investors don't care about uh, if their values align with their investments. They just want the maximum profit or return on their investments any way they can get it uh, with the least amount of risk. And But some investors do want, and some of, a lot of my clients want to make sure that uh, in addition to generating a good return to help them achieve their financial goals, that the companies that and the financial assets that they are invested in do good in their communities as well as generating a, a profit. Uh, the environmental side of ESG uh, focuses on companies' ability to limit exposure to climate risks and other environmental risks and take advantage of opportunities presented by the transition to a low carbon economy. The social aspect of ESG focuses on companies' ability to create value through a productive workforce, high quality products, and positive community relations to minimize costs of product recalls, related litigation, and reputational risks. And lastly, the G in ESG stands for focusing on companies' ability to align interests of management, shareholders, and other key stakeholders over the long term, incentivize sustainable values, creation and ethical practices, and reduce reputational damage in the firm's investments. Sustainable, sustainable investing has grown significantly over the last few years, or over the last decade, actually. Uh, the number of sustainable, open-ended, and exchange-traded funds available to U.S. investors rose to nearly 600 in 2022. Uh, that was up 12% from 2021. Uh, the flows into U.S. sustainable funds sank or decreased to $3.1 billion in 2022. That's the lowest level in seven years. And according to Morningstar data, assets in U.S. sustainable funds climbed to $286 billion at the end of 2022, which is a 20% decline from the all-time high of $358 billion at the end of 2021. In 2022, the 87 new sustainable funds that launched topped the number from 2021, but lagged the record of 121 set in 2021. And all of this data comes from the Morningstar Sustainable Funds U.S. Landscape Report that came out in February 21st of 2023. So why do people even consider sustainable investing or investing sustainably? sustainably? One of the main reasons is by the, the people believe or analysts believe, investors believe, who believe in sustainable investing, believe that by adding this additional increased level of scrutiny to their investment analysis, they are attempting to manage risk, improve returns, and drive an impact in the companies and society through their investments. People might be interested in sustainable investing like my nun clients um, or religious order due to religious beliefs, to environmental goals or beliefs regarding the environment, protecting the environment, to their political views, to their health. For example, someone whose uh, mother died of lung cancer probably would not want to invest or may not want to invest in companies that create cigarettes or manufacture cigarettes or in the tobacco business. People that are interested in a more sustainable future for our society and for our planet, uh, people that want to make a difference through their investments. And let's be frank, it, for many people it makes them feel better, it makes them feel like by investing this money it's not just about money and profit, the investments, 
but it's also trying to do good for society and for communities through their investment assets. And this makes them feel better. Some of the knocks on sustainable investing or why not to do sustainable investing. Uh, as I mentioned previously, many believe that the objective of investing should be to maximize the investor and shareholder value above all else. So maximizing profit and returns with minimizing risk at the same time, regardless of how that objective is attained. We can go back and forth, and depending on what research report you read and what time period you're looking at, uh, investment returns may be negatively affected or positive, positively affected by sustainable investing strategies. It's just, it's like any other investment strategy, growth, value, small company, large company, tech, hedge fund, long, short. Some people win with those strategies and some people lose. Some people win and lose. And sustainable investing is no different. Depending on what type of strategy is, is, is followed in terms of sustainable investing, which there are li literally an infinite number, just like there are an infinite number of investment strategies, that will affect the returns that are generated for that portfolio. And it may be in a positive or a negative way. Indiv individual investors have very different opinions on what good or bad environmental, social, and government governance issues are. So just because a fund says it's an ESG fund or an ESG positive fund or it has a very high Morningstar ESG rating, that doesn't mean for a particular investor that they would consider those ESG characteristics in line with their specific values. There are an infinite number of investors. Some investors who might consider environmental factors uh, might not, other investors might not consider environmental factors, but they may be more interested in social issues or governance issues. So it's not a one size fits all strategy. Just like any investment strategy is not going to be a one size fits all for every investor or every risk tolerance solution. So what are, are some of the environmental factors with respect to environmental, social, and governance types of strategies and investing? Of course, we have the issue of climate change. This deals with key considerations of operational and reputational risks. Are the companies being proactive with respect to their strategies and the implementation of their business plans with respect to their reputation and climate change? Will their reputation be negatively affected or positively affected based on what they're doing with relation to adapting to climate change? Emission and waste, obviously. Do, you, does, do the companies pollute? Are they uh, cognizant and proactive about minimizing the damage that they do as a company to the environment? This could affect their reputation, which could in turn affect their financial performance, which in turn could affect their stock price or their bond price. And are they making efficient use of their resources, such as cost of, cost of capital, with respect to environmental factors? Social factors can include diversity, human capital, and safety innovation and increased productivity, recruiting and retaining talented employees, product integrity and supply chain management. Again, we go back to the, the company's reputation with respect to these issues, the costs associated with product recalls and related litigation because they're not cognizant or not maintaining good product supply chain management with respect to integrity and what effect does the company have on the overall on their overall community are they making regardless of 
the profit and return they're making for their stakeholders, are they also having a positive impact on their community as a whole? Various governance factors include board and executive diversity. Is the board made up of a diverse group representative of society uh, for decision making and are various uh, groups and various interests represented across the board or is it weighted towards any one type of thinking? Uh, the corporate structure and accounting and tra transparency. Um, is the accountability to shareholders transparent for the company and are they risking any regulatory penalties that might affect their reputation and their financial performance? And how are the executive co executives compensated? Is the compensation plan fair? Is everyone, uh, regardless of race, color, gender, compensated equally based on merit? Or are there various factors where the compensation scheme is not fair with respect to uh, the diverse workforce or executive workforce makeup? So how is a sustainable investment policy or program implemented? There are three basic strategies. One is called negative or exclusionary screens, and I will cover each one of these in turn. A second is called positive screens or best in, a best-in-class strategy. And then there's the activist investment or investor strategy. And these go, can go by different names, um, but these are basically the three types of strategies for implementing a sustainable investment or socially responsible investment strategy. So let's talk about the first one, negative or exclusionary screens. Uh, this is what my religious order client, this is the strategy that they had us following. Again, they did not want to include various sin stocks, such as tobaccos, weapons, gambling, pornography, contracep contraception or abortion, uh, fossil fuel production, or animal testing. These are your classic sin stocks. Again, uh, they didn't care about alcohol. We could invest in Anheuser-Busch. Uh, that wasn't a problem, but they did have an issue with these others, so we had to make sure that their portfolio did not include companies that were involved in these types of businesses or factors. And we have positive screens or best in class. This is where you are not excluding companies because they're involved in something, but we're investing in the best companies in this area. So for example, in the fossil fuel example, we're not excluding companies that are involved in producing fossil fuels, but we're investing in the best company from a environmental, social, and governance standpoint in those industries and including those in the portfolios and excluding and weighting all the other companies in that industry on a weighted basis and including less of companies that are not as good as the top companies in that industry with respect to env environmental, social, and governance requirements. This is also known as the less bad strategy. And then we have an activist investor strategy. This is where we're actually investing in companies that we want to change something in by being an investor. When we don't invest in, in a company, um, we're really, we really don't have much say or impact in what that company does. We cannot impact because we're not a shareholder. We can maybe not buy their products, but we can't impact them through the stock market or the bond market or the financial markets by not investing in their securities. But if we invest in that company's securities, we can vote on various issues like board diversity, like environmental issues. Uh, we can vote on shareholder resolutions and we can put forth our own resolutions because we are shareholders to 
present to the board, and these are subject to the amount of shares you hold. Obviously, if I hold one, one share of a company, I'm not going to be able to put forth my own resolution. Uh, so there are all kinds of SEC and corporate rules regarding this. But in general, if I own a certain number of shares, I can put forth a resolution or vote a certain way on various corporate issues. And then I have more of an impact in what that the strategy and the implementation of what that company does. And I can affect somehow, somewhat, uh, their strategy and their action with respect to environmental, social, and governance issues, where if I don't invest in the company, I really can't. I can't do that at all. Aside from the traditional equity or stock research analysis, additional questions and screens needed to be examined before selecting individual securities. Uh, here are some of the questions that an investor might want to ask with respect their investment manager or companies that they're considering investing in uh, to determine if they're appropriate for their investment strategy. Uh, number one, what are the long-term ramifications to the environment, community, employees, consumers, etc., of this company's new project or product? Number two, does the company have adequate representation of women, minorities, etc., on their board of director, directors and their C-level management? That would be their, their highest level management. Number three, does the company adequately communicate safety issues, security breaches, policy changes, responses to controversies, etc., to the public? Number four, what is the company's stance on human rights, abortion, conservation, gun laws, privacy violations, military actions, treatment of LGBTQ individuals, etc. Does the company have any plans to divest from fossil fuels or lower its carbon emissions over the next 5, 10, 30, etc. years? How likely is the company to listen and adhere to shareholder advocacy proposals? Is their board of directors attentive to these wishes? And does one have to look deep into the corporate supply chain to find human rights violations? So these are some questions that uh, investment managers can ask companies or you doing the research uh, can research to determine uh, whether a company is positive or negative in terms of various social and environmental and governance issues. So let me again give an example of an exclusionary strategy uh, that several of my clients expressed an interest of in and wanted me to do some research on and that's the and this is this is a very popular strategy out there in the investment world and uh, I did some research and this is what I, I came up with and again I'm not advocating any of these strategies positive or negatives I'm simply presenting the results of my research and of various experiences as, an, as a financial advisor and giving that information to my clients and allowing them to determine what direction they would like to take. I'm not advocating invest, divestment of fossil fuels or the investment in fossil fuels, um, but this is what the data shows. As of February 9th of 2022, in the U.S., there were only 15 mutual funds touted as sustainable, and the way we, we are measuring that is with the highest sustainable rating from Morningstar. They also have a five-star, just like their five-star mutual fund rating, which rates based on their criteria, the Morningstar criteria, of how good of an investment or bad of an investment a mutual fund is or a, an exchange traded fund they also have a similar metric for sustainability so there are only 15 funds that had the highest five star sustainable rating from Morningstar that had zero exposure according to Morningstar to fossil fuels so not a lot not a lot of data or data set based on on mutual funds. 
And what zero exposure means is that means that the funds have had no investments in thermal coal extraction, thermal coal power generation, oil and gas production, oil and gas power generation, and oil and gas products and services during the past 12 months, again, according to the researchers at Morningstar. And here's the source for that information. Investors pursuing a divestment strategy may have multiple obje objections, objectives, excuse me. Investors pursuing a divestment strategy may have multiple objectives, some of which may need to be balanced against each other, and these may include mitigating long-term climate and financial risks posed by potentially stranded assets. And what that means is those assets of companies that are involved in fossil fuel development, if those assets aren't used, meaning people are divesting in these companies and they're no longer producing their fossil fuels, what is the long-term climate and financial risk of those assets not being used anymore? And sending a clear strong message to the market by not investing in fossil fuels and minimizing a short-term portfolio carbon footprint. There are many more. One of the things that I learned in my research is that there are a lot more considerations in establishing a fossil fuel divestment policy than meets the eye. It's not just as simple as let's just divest of all companies that do fossil fuels or make fossil fuel products. With those objectives in mind, investors typically consider the following questions when constructing divestment policies and mandates. What types of fossil fuels? Does that mean everything? Does that only mean coal? Does it only mean oil and gas? Etc. What activities? Are we divesting in utilities? Only the companies that own reserves in these fuels? The companies that extract it? The companies that distribute it? Distribute it? These companies might, in fact, do many other things as well and might negatively affect a portfolio or positively uh, by deciding to divest in those companies. What measures are we using and where are we setting the threshold? So if, if a company receives 1% of their revenues from some type of fossil fuel business, are we excluding them? What's the threshold? Is it 10%? Is it 30%? Is it 50%? Are we excluding companies that do power generation with a percentage, even though they're using wind and solar and other ways to generate power? Are we excluding them altogether if they have a portion or a percentage of their power generation from fossil fuels? And what strategies are, are we using to implement these strategies? Are we using an active, a passive, or a benchmark strategy? And I will talk more about what these strategies entail and how they work on a subsequent slide. So a lot of more factors to consider than we might think. This cube is a graphic of various entities and where they fall on the previous slide's considerations in terms of their fossil fuel divestment strategy. So, for example, uh, the narrowest strategy would be the California pension plans, the CalPERS and CalSTRS plans. That's what those acronyms stand for. Um, so they're only going to divest in thermal coal only and that are high in producing thermal coal that are low in reserve ownership um, where the city of Copenhagen is going to have the broadest 
considerations. So they're they're not go they're divesting of anyone or anything or any company that has anything to do with fossil fuels, including everyone along the entire value chain of the supply chain with manufacturing fossil fuels. So there's a lot of area for interpretation when it comes to this, this issue, as we can see by this graphic. So how is this strategy performed? Divesting of fossil fuels in a portfolio. Um, and I need to have some disclaimers here in the data I'm about to present, which is is very available data out there um, in the public domain. Um, and like any data or any rate of return, the past performance is no guarantee of future performance. So just because it performed this way during a certain time period does not in any way mean that it's it is performing, going to perform that way in the future. These, the data I'm going to share is based on the performance of index funds. So a company puts together an index based on certain funds like the S&P 500, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with. And that's what we base this analysis on. And index funds are purely a at their purest form, a theoretical construct and can't be replicated exactly because in any replication, you're going to have transaction costs and that is going to skew uh, the relationship between the theoretical data and the actual data. Uh, different time periods will have different results. So just be the, the data that we're showing, I believe is through 2017 and it might be different through 2023 and the data doesn't currently exist yet for those time periods. And the S&P 500 index is only a limited asset class with respect to the entire market of security. So it is very limited. With, it's primarily the largest 500 U.S. company, publicly traded company stocks. Um, it is not a bond. It is not smaller stocks, etc. So it's just a slice of the entire market of securities. So the most famous information or study in this area is by the investor Jeremy Grantham um, of GMO Asset Management and his study and basically his determination was that no matter which of the 10 sectors of the S&P 500 were excluded, the difference in returns over the nearly 30 year period from 1989 through 2017 was no more than half a percent. So not just excluding energy, but you could exclude any one of these sectors, such as consumer discretionary, consumer staples, financials, health and healthcare, et cetera. Only one, if you just excluded one, there would only be a half a percent difference in performance based on that time period. And here we see from this graphic, that the overall S&P 500 re returned 9.71 during the period of 1989 through 2017. And when we took out the energy sector, it, retur it returned 9.74. So actually slightly, slightly better, but this is during that specific time period. From 1957 to 2017, the S&P returned 10.25 versus 10.818, excluding energy. So slightly lower excluding energy, but not significant. And again, from the Jeremy Grantham GMO Asset Management Study, from 1925 through 2017, so a pretty long time period, uh, the difference between the best and worst performing categories of all the sectors was only just over half a percent, which is shown here in that graphic. So not very significant. But again, this is only the S&P 500 that this data is available on. 
So how would you implement, if you did want to implement a fossil fuel divestment performance strategy, what are some of the things you can do? An active strategy, that's basically where you're doing all your own research and voting your own proxies. So you're researching the companies, determining which you want to invest or not invest in, and then if you're investing in those companies, you're voting the proxies to try and influence the various strategies uh, that the company is, is putting forth. A passive strategy is to communicate to your, your investment directive to your investment manager to implement or to try to implement it using different investment vehicles such as mutual funds, exchange traded funds, index funds, etc. But again, if you're doing it on your own, even if you're doing it through a mutual fund or exchange traded fund, you have to do the research. Even if the fund's name has sustainability in it, you have to do the, the research to ensure that it does, in fact, align with your values and with your investment objectives. And more importantly, your risk tolerance. And lastly, you can take a really passive approach, which is called a benchmark approach, and you can pick a benchmark such as the MSCI ACWI X Coal or X Fossil Fuels that is a benchmark of various companies that does not invest in companies that are involved with coal or fossil fuel pr production, respectively. And if these, you can actually buy these indices. If you agree with their strategy, you could just see what they invest in and implement the strategy yourself by mimicking what the indexes or indices invest in and excluding what they don't invest in. However, this would still probably be a very work intensive uh, operation for an investor. So that's my presentation on sustainable investing, divesting from fossil fuels. I hope you found it interesting. I hope you learned something. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at cyril.white at fourfinancial.com or my phone number. Give me a call. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, you can comment on whatever social media platform I am posting this on. If there's anything else my firm can help you with in relation to wealth management, tax planning, tax preparation, estate planning, any of those areas, we'd love to help you. Please let us know and please read all of these important notes and disclaimers because they're very important and Obviously, investment involves risks, and these opinions are only my opinions and not the opinions of anyone else. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.